We are live with JP from Thorchain. Uh, it's really good to, to talk to you again. It's been a long time. Um, uh, we've been communicating in real time. Uh, but uh, JP is one of the researchers at Thorchain, which is probably the oldest Cosmos Phi pro uh, uh, pro pro project, if I were to. I remember when I, 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 I have a really fun memory of speaking at web three summit in um in berlin and i want to say 2018 That's um correct. and some people started show coming up to me and asking me like really complicated questions about the cosmos sdk and i'm like who are these people how why are they asking such complicated questions where did they come from uh and uh Little did I know what Thorchain would become, and uh, how much of the and you know the uh, 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 I guess the stubborn and gr stubbornness and grit to bring the vision to life. But like Thorchain is real today, and it's 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 amazing. Um, yeah, I think so. so. Yeah. Why don't we talk a little bit about why uh, what Thorchain? I mean, what is Thorchain? Like uh, uh, just to, to simplify it down for uh, the uninitiated. Yeah, Thorchain Thor is a cross-chain liquidity protocol. Basically, you can call it a cross-chain Uniswap, for those familiar with Ethereum DeFi. Essentially, put in one asset on one chain, get out and of the asset on a completely different chain. And I, again, I want to like you know uh, give props for like this vision seems like obvious in 2021, but you guys started working on this in like 2018. <laughs> yeah, that's correct. So, and, I mean, Cosmos hadn't even launched then, so. The team was still trying to work out the best tech stack, and it did change a bit until 2019. But early on, it was always about Cosmos, uh, MPC, and uh, liquidity pools, and that's that's never changed. And that was even prior to Uniswap. So the team had to derive the liquidity formula from first principles, and that's why it's different to to most what you see today. Oh, yeah, it was derived from first principles. I actually didn't know this. This is now new to me, or I didn't remember it. So what is the liquidity formula on uh, on, uh, on on Thorchain? Yeah, so it actually doesn't use an invariant, uh, a bit like your typical constant function market, make, market uh -huh. making algorithm like Uniswap. Um, the whole idea of using an invariant didn't come out until, um, well, Vitalik's post on Reddit, which then Hayden and the Uniswap team implemented uh, and unveiled uh, at the DevCon 4 uh, in Ukraine later this year later that in 2018. But prior to that, the only example of liquidity pools was Bancor. And that was, they launched in late 2017 and, and early 2018. That was the only DeFi uh, liquidity pool protocol. So the, yeah. I guess the team looked at that, then they they looked at deriving it um, basically around the idea that if you put in an asset on one side, you get out the asset on the other, um, just using the ratio after the trade. Mm. And you, you can actually derive it as though it had an invariant, but it doesn't have an invariant, what you call K in, in the XYK formula. Yep. Um, but the biggest question the team had to solve later that year was how what fees to use. And the idea of using fixed rate fees, 30 basis points, wasn't, um, it was the first and most obvious thing, but the team realized that having a fixed rate fees doesn't, it doesn't create a market of, uh, allow a market of demand for liquidity to arise. So on Ethereum, if you want your transaction to go through, you can either pay miners to push your transaction through or you just pay more gas. But the idea is is to extract that value. But instead of miner, miners getting that, uh, the idea is that people are, are trying to compete, but their fees, when they compete with each other, are going to liquidity providers. So that's the origin of the slip-based fee. So the more aggressive you want liquidity and the more demanding you are of the liquidity pools, then the higher fees that you pay, and instead of those fees going to miners or validators, it goes into the liquidity pool uh, for LPs. So that that's why slip based fees and why uh, Thorchain's formula. So you know what is unique about Thorchain is Thorchain is bringing DeFi to assets that have that don't have DeFi, don't have their own native DeFi. I I, I kind of think of that as the kind of a uh, uh, summary of, of kind of like the mission of Thorchain. Uh, would you agree with that? Yeah, it actually works best on dumb chains um, <laughs> and throwing it out lightly, um, dumb chains like Litecoin, Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, etc. Um, that they can't really do much. 
um, because they're strictly limited in, in scope and complexity. So the most complicated bridge that Thorchain is connected to today is the Ethereum bridge. Um, and a lot of the nuances and edge cases that have come about over the last three months of testing the wild in with real money and on real, uh, real funds is coming from Ethereum. Um, the other chains are actually quite easy. They have things like uh, UTXOs, which are easy to handle than accounts uh, on sequence numbers uh, or nonces. Uh, you can use child pace for parents. So you can consume a pending output uh, as the as the child of a, of a new um, new input so you don't have stuck transactions like you have on ethereum so if you if you broadcast a transaction at a specific nonce with a low gas rate every other transaction is basically blocked um so this this is a, an, an edge case that thorchain has to kind of use a bit of brute force to solve um and it's not very elegant at the moment but on bitcoin like on bitcoin cash etc it's really simple just spend the pending um, utxo and it's quite quite easy so uh, yeah, I mean, there's a whole bunch of other things going on. Oh, and I mean, even ERC-20s are a nightmare to deal with. Um, Ethereum actually has a router, a smart contract, that handles the deposits of um, these ERC-20 tokens, and it actually handles Ethereum differently to ERC-20s. But anyway, but yeah, it, it, I got in a bit of a rabbit hole there about different... Oh, uh, yeah, models. no, I mean... But, um, yeah. I mean, ThorChain <laughs> is, uh, is, is, is right at the coal face of all the complexity of all these different protocols, right? Um, uh, and, uh, yeah, I mean, you guys are, you guys are living the multi-chain vision really, really well. Um, so what we like to talk about in the sommelier podcast is, you know, how did, what is it, you know, how, how does being a liquidity provider, uh, differ between, uh, uh, on, in like different ecosystems, uh, out there and we want to bring the, the finest of liquidity and, and, uh, Thorchain is an excellent place to bring your liquidity, but why don't you, can you maybe walk us through a little bit about what the experience of being a liquidity provider is uh, on Thorchain? Like, uh, you know, I have some Bitcoin, I have some Monero, uh, I have, you know, whatever. Uh, I have some Litecoin. Uh, I want to be a liquidity provider on Thorchain. How do, how do I do that? Yeah, sure. So uh, the, Thorchain is able to connect you to, to two different chains at the same time, and it doesn't peg or wrap assets. That's part of um, that is an absolute principle of Thorchain. It will never peg or wrap assets because it doesn't believe that you can adequately secure pegged or wrapped assets. Because it, having pegged or wrapped assets, the only way to build a security budget is by charging demurrage or redemption fees, um, and heaven forbid, charging mint fees because you'll never get anyone onboarding. Uh, but the typical way is to charge demurrage, which means fees in transit, or a redemption fees. And both of those, uh, we struggle to understand how the, you can maintain enough of a moat to defend against um, thwarting those redemption or demurrage fees. Um, so as a result, pegging your wrapping protocols are very difficult because they don't really have a viable long-term security budget. However, uh, as someone on, uh, on Monet Supply to Earth on Twitter has um, eloquently summarized, uh, Thorchain is able to have a really big security budget, and today 20% of its income is derived from fees, is because it uh, co-mingles decentralized custody of assets with uh, on-chain DeFi, so liquidity. Anyway, so that's, that's just a little aside, but the problem with abstracting um, user balances on different chains is you need, a, you need to logically centralize them, and that's done in the Thorchain state machine. So it's aware of your balance on different chains and what balances are attributed to you. So at the end so, of what I'm trying to say, you need to make three transactions. Like, what, 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 let's, let's like kind of drill into this. So, because uh, I, I, I like this idea and it's, it's, it's a beautiful idea. So in ThorChain, I have Zucky's balance on ThorChain. And my balance could be have Bitcoin, but it's not Bitcoin that's wrapped in uh, uh it's not wrapped to bitcoin that is available on thorchain but it is a bitcoin balance uh that is in the decentralized custodian um on, but on the bitcoin chain um and i have a, a litecoin balance uh that's the same um and the only sort of asset that like is transacted on the thorchain chain i think is room that's correct yeah so you make basically you have to make two transactions and you got to link them together because uh, liquidity providers, uh, at the end of the day, they have to provide 50% rune and 50% asset because Thorchain's yep. security model is that it couples the value of assets 
with the value of the rune in its pools. And then all it tries to do is make sure that the bonded um, amount of rune for nodes, which is the security of the network, is always double the pooled rune. So if bonded rune is twice the amount of pooled rune, it means mathematically that all nodes uh, can never steal because they will lose more than they can steal, uh, assuming that they can only steal the assets and rune goes to zero when, when they steal. So that's what that's how the security system works. But you need to make these two transactions, a rune transaction and then a Bitcoin transaction. Um, and so what you do is you basically make the transactions on both chains around about the same time and you cross refer your addresses on either side. So you got Zach's address on Bitcoin and Zach's address on ThorChain. And you make a memo on ThorChain which refers to your Bitcoin address and you make a transaction on Bitcoin which refers to your ThorChain address. So when, when ThorChain sees those two transactions and the amounts contained in those transactions, it goes, oh, this is Zaki's uh, two transactions and it throws you into the liquidity pool. And basically, you don't get a deposit token or a liquidity token like on most um, ETH AMM. Instead, the state machine is aware of your original deposit values and your ownership of the liquidity pool. So 30 days, 60 days, nine days later, when you when you want to redeem, by the way, you can do your redemption transaction from either Bitcoin or ThorChain as long as you do it from the transaction that you cross-referred to in the original so that ThorChain can identify you. And then it goes, oh, Zaki wants to withdraw 50% of his liquidity out. So it will redeem 50% of your liquidity at the current pool price and send those two assets back to your Bitcoin address and back to your Rune address. However, ThorChain is cognizant of the fact that not all people want to make these two transactions. So you can actually contribute liquidity in an unbalanced way or even on a single side. So you can just make a Bitcoin transaction or just make a Rune transaction and you'll still get entered into the same pool. And ThorChain's um, formula for liquidity provision accounts for the, the, uh, the imbalance and awards you a slightly less of a pool share, which is mathematically the same as though you had swapped swapped half of your assets to one prior to adding liquidity. Does it make sense? So everyone gets a fair amount of liquidity, whether you add two, two sides or single sides. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I hope that makes but sense. But if I, I mean, like that begs the question, if I exit, am I exiting into two assets or am I exiting back into only one asset? You can exit um, dual or single. Just the same oh. as you can enter dual and single. Yeah. So if you if you have a Bitcoin and you you add liquidity using just Bitcoin, thirty days later you can just you can withdraw just a Bitcoin if you wanted to, um, or you can add dual and withdraw single in either direction. And yeah, and all Fortune does is is it basically takes half your asset, swaps it together, and sends you the full balance on one side. Yeah. So that, single dual in and single dual out. Amazing. So, you know. You could be, you can basically be a Bitcoiner today, and hold non-custodial, no KYC, uh, DeFi liquidity providing from your Bitcoin without having to buy any other asset. Uh, uh, just by you know uh, going, is where's the user? Where where do I find the user interface for uh, for doing yeah, this? Yeah, so. Yeah, so I mean, Cosmos has a um, awesome interface to connect to. It's very similar to most of Web two, just an, on an API. So anyone can build an interface that wraps ThorChain State Machine and, and query into it via Midgard, which is the public consumer mm -hmm. database uh, querier. And so any interface can be built on top of ThorChain to show you your your owed balances and your pool ownership. To make those transactions, uh, the team helped build something called CrossChain JS. Um, so crosschain js basically wraps ether js bitcoin js cosmos js um you know all the js libraries for different chains and it defines it under a single interface uh, so that wallet developers don't need to learn 10 different wallet libraries in order to jump into the multi-chain vision they can just learn crosschain js which wraps all these um, underlying libraries you anyway, know so if you're a developer you just wrap the uh, you, you interface with the midgard api and you import npm install Crosschain JS, and away you go. You can start making transactions and. and okay. Uh, well, well, what about for those of us who aren't developers? So yeah, that and that's where all these wallets interfaces are coming through. So Shapeshift, Trust Wallet. Um, there's a whole bunch of more wallets popping up. There's ThorSwap, Asgard dot Exchange. Asgard, uh, do you know? Do you know off the top of your head which wallets let you LP or, uh, are do most uh, wallets let you LP and swap or just swap? I actually, I, I mean, I I, yeah, I know so about. Yeah, there's three levels of interface. There's like there's just supporting Thor.Rune, which is the standard wallet. Uh, supporting swaps. So Shapeshift supports swaps. It doesn't support LPing because LPing is, is a lot of user experience challenges there. Um, yep. Trust Wallet Noon supports swaps. 
Uh, and then the more uh, adventurous wallets are going to be start start soon supporting uh, liquidity provision from inside uh, the wallet interfaces. But today the the LP wallets, um, basically the Thorchain community design like Thorswap dot finance and etc. So those are the ones to use. But um, interesting, you mentioned like what if I'm a, I'm a Bitcoin hodl and I want to participate. So the only issue with Thorchain, well, there's several issues, and we can discuss the pros and cons. Thorchain requires you to hold Rune and have a price exposure to Rune. Um, it also exposed you to impairment loss, which is a function of just um, AMMs. Although yep. it does provide you impairment loss insurance, which we can discuss how that works. But basically, it gives you 100% insurance after 100 days with 1% per day. So it requires you to stay in the pool for three months, three and a bit months. Um, and the, the, so it gives, but however, being an LP, a Bitcoin LP, exposed you to the rune, exposed you to impairment loss, and it exposed you to variable um yield so the yield fluctuates depending on the volume of the fees and, and the block rewards of any day the block rewards are a function of the incentive pendulum which is a function of the network security so everything's variable and that's quite a bit to, to that's quite a hurdle for new people they got to worry about so many different things and the user experience is quite difficult so it's an advanced function so the team came up with this new economic primitive which is called uh liquidity synth liquidity synths so it's uh, we can try and explain the the how the economics work basically it uh, mints uh, synthetic Bitcoin from the collateral of your LP share, but basically waives any impairment loss risk, waives any pr price exposure to ruin, and will soon have fixed yield. And that's a bit of a trick by knowing that Bitcoin will always has always has always liquidity to allow redemptions of these synthetic assets towards. So we can lock you into a synthetic asset of Bitcoin. And give you a much better use experience. No price exposure to ruin, um, no impairment loss, and fixed yield. So that's coming soon, and that's mainly for people who don't want to wrap their head around more complex um, use experience. Mm. I mean, that sounds like, that that sounds like a fantastic user experience. Uh, so, someone is taking the other side of that trade. Um, like, there's the no protocol system. does. So yeah, the the protocol is betting with these synthetic assets. The protocol bets that Rune will always outperform in aggregate all of its synthetic assets. Um, <laughs> and if it doesn't, then the protocol will have to cough up more Rune from its reserve in order to honor the redemption. Um, mm. So so that's the bet. The protocol is, make, is making a bet that by supporting synthetic assets, it can drive in more TVL, charge more fees, and then and grow um, and defend against any um, downside risk of uh, having an asset outperform Rune. Um, but if the asset does outperform Rune, the synthetic asset, then the protocol will have to cough up more on that redemption. Fascinating. Wow. Yeah. So like, that, 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 is a, that is an interesting bet that the, uh, the, that the Rune holders are making. Um, yeah, for sure. Fascinating and, and, and awesome. Um, so the other, the other, the other yeah, thing yeah, that you can probably understand Thorchain to be is it's a decentralized vault manager. That's all it is at the end of the day. And like 95% of the complexity of Thorchain is dealing with being a decentralized vault manager. Which and, is what Sommelier is, is sort of moving in that same direction, right? Yeah. Um, and exactly. This stuff is very hard, especially because the way you can think of it is Tendermint is partially, um, partially synchronous. You know, you have timeouts, the block needs to be done in, you know, Two and a half seconds or committed in, you know but so the whole block gets done in about five to six seconds depending on the, the node to pop around the, you know how the node yeah. is up to around the world but tenement you would describe tenement as partially synchronous right it's slightly right. async and it doesn't make, it block. does it, it does not make a guarantees about when blocks will be made uh yeah which is but it is it is a synchronized protocol but it's not fully synchronized yep Yes, it's it's like a hybrid, which makes it very interesting because it Thorchain running on Tenement is partially synchronous, but it connects to fully asynchronous networks like Bitcoin and, and proof of work Ethereum, right? These are fully async chains. You have yep. no idea when the it's like it's no coordination, it's just produce a block when you you know when you do the proof of work. Yep. But MPC, which is multi party computation, is fully synchronized. So what the thought the Thorchain team had to do was how to bring together asynchronous networks with a partially synchronized network being Tendermint with a fully synchronized network, which is the MPC, and they actually all exist on different layers. So a Thor node runs 
all three services. It runs the full nodes for Bitcoin, a full node for Thorchain, and then a like a server, a TSS server, which has its own P2P layer that hooks up to the other Thor nodes. Um, but getting all those three protocols, even just working together, is such a it's so complex. And Thorchain is um, is what we call eventually consistent, or it it's eventually it eventually does stuff because even to the TSS aspect, if not all nodes are perfectly in sync, then the, the, the signature doesn't get signed, right? So, mm -hmm. and, but all, more than that, you're dealing with, um, yeah, so the solution to all of this is to have eventual consistency, to, to acknowledge that in some parts of the process, you're gonna be partially insolvent, but you'll eventually become solvent um, across the time space. Or yep. you're partially synchronized, but you'll eventually synchronize by having timeouts and and redelegation and you know reappointment of, of you know different TSS uh, leaders and whatnot. So it's very very difficult. And when you when you finally converge to a solution that works, <laughs> you pull that string and you don't you don't stop pulling it. And that's what happened to Thorchain's team over the last three years is just making all those three protocols work together. And they've come up with something that bloody works. And then they're just pulling that string and then they're locked into it. Um, and there's a thousand ways to do this, Aki, as you, as you know. Once yep. you get something that works, you just pull that string and you don't you don't stop pulling in that direction and, and you just optimize forward. Yeah, and that's what ThoughtChain is. It's it kind of stumbled upon a solution that works and it's it's leading leading ahead. But getting that solution and wrapping your head around that to make it work with you know one hundred different nodes across the planet, um, with five different networks all at the same time is 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 a minefield so just be aware i mean i will also say that with so i agree with you about the difficulty i fully agree with you about the difficulty i also think yeah it is uh i mean the last three months of you know the chaos net being live have just been amazing to watch like without a doubt <laughs> uh uh you know uh i i i'm like Am I sure that Thorchain works? Not, <laughs> not always, but you know, it's been running in production and there is nothing that speaks like running in production uh, with real money. Um, yeah, you know, that's correct. That, I mean, that, there have been probably 15 significant bugs found over the last three yep. months on the cast net. But you but haven't I'm lost saying, anyone's money yet. Yeah, so this sounds like a bit wild west, but you cannot find these issues in testnet. You can't even find them in, in your mock nets. Like there, you'll find issues on testnet. You will have never thought of on, even on your mock net. And you'll find issues on, on chaos net that you would never have come across in the testnet environment because yep. the complexity theory is just huge. This is not a, you know, a 600 line smart contract that you can really reason about the ins and the outs here. You, yep. you're, you're dealing with something that's, you know, orders of magnitude more complex. And so the only way to do it is you've just got to go to production. You've got to go to CastNet. You've got to have a treasury aside or like an insurance fund. You've got to be willing to lose it all. And, and it sounds wild west, but you, honestly, you have to take that step. And the crazy thing about it, Zaki, is you've got to do it and have a credible claim to decentralization. So if you launch with like, you know, timeout keys or emergency hatch keys for funds or, or anything like that, you're never going to turn those things off. You're never going to turn those measures off. You were centralized from the start and you couldn't decentralize. So the team made a very big, big goal of launching in a completely decentralized way with no emergency keys or anything. There, I will say there are uh, MIMA keys or slash admin keys that can tweak parameters of the networks um, and even emergencies halt inbounds, but it, they don't halt outbounds. So there, there are kind of like admin tweak keys that can tweak network constants but these admin keys do not have access to funds then nothing to do with the tss key sharing uh, yep. so it was a huge step to do that and the only way you can do that is um yeah is be sure that uh or just be willing willing to be humbled and willing to react quickly and uh but you've just got to take that step absolutely no uh i think the the, I think chaos net is a is a is an absolutely brilliant thing, and I mean, the potential of the system is really, like you know, I, I frequently say to people, you know, Uniswap and Ethereum DeFi gets a lot of credit, um, uh, and the volumes are insane. But you know, 
Thorchain is a is sort of a paradigm breaking system. Um, Thorchain is the functionality that we have long believed could only be exist in a custodial centralized exchange where in a single organization and truly brings it into a decentralized setting. Um, and you know, as ChaosNet continues to mature, it it will it sets this pace of hey, there it, it there really you know the, it, probably the only thing we can't decentralize to a meaningful extent is the is the fiat crypto interface. I think we can decentralize everything else. Yeah, I mean things that will help that is more adoption of stable coins. So you know, fast forward five years. Everyone in America has got a Coinbase account and rocking around with the USDC. That you know that will accelerate it. And USDC is partially, you know, it's it's more of like an open fire system where, you know, you can do you can do funky stuff with the USDC on the different public networks, um, and you yeah, know, you can I, somewhat censor, but it's way better than fiat in a bank account. And I, oh, it is mass, uh, you know, it is massively better than fiat in the bank account. Uh, just uh, dealing with the USD, I've been dealing with the USDC, um, uh, a fiat interface today. It was, it, it's always painful, but you know, it's it with Circle going public uh, that got announced today. Like, we, I, I love the that 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 term open fi. Like, you know, it is it is what what USDC is is just absolutely fascinating. Uh, stable coins are 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 really setting that path forward. But yes. Uh, you know, to come back to Thorchain, like Thorchain is really, is really, you know, uh, assuming that some sort of open file system like that exists, um, you know, as, as things like Thorchain mature, we're really setting up a world where we're sort of uh, uh, the, uh, the Bitcoin banks of the past, the Coinbases and the Binances of the world uh, have a much smaller role to play. Yeah, exactly. And um, you know, there's a lot of things that are ugly about Thorchain um, and not very, not, you know, just things you have to cross and, and hurdles you need to jump over. Like you have to hold Rune as the settlement asset. There's no other way because of the economic security of the network. Um, it's very state intensive on the Bifrost. The Bifrost don't scale well. Um, you know, they're probably realistically only between 100 to 200 validators can ever be on the network. So it's not crazy decentralized. But Thorchain, only stood out to be better than three dudes with multi seek, and it's so that, that's an important distinction here. For ten years, we've we've had one dude with a EOA, like you know, think Mt. Gox or you know Quadriga or all of those exchanges, um, and then we, we upgraded that to three dudes with a multi sig, um, like think think of like Bitmax, you know, Binance use multi sigs and whatnot. So we're we're at that three dudes with a multi sig level, but still that's not good enough. Because three dudes with a multi sig can still be captured, aka you know Bitmax founders um, or Binance having to you know play the game of regulatory arbitrage and still be shut out of certain jurisdictions because they are three dudes with multi sig. So Thorchain only tries to be better than three dudes with multi sig, and that is a huge important distinction to make. That it's saying that yeah, it's not just better; it's it's thirty times more decentralized. It's got a hundred nodes, not three people, for one. Two is these nodes are not captured. There's no names, no faces, um, just IP addresses, public addresses, and they can churn it out every three days. So it's it's like you catch me if I can, you know, because the network churns so fast, it's so hard to capture it. Um, and the reason why it doesn't allow delegation is just trying to avoid the slippery slope of centralization and, and to avoid subjectivity being exerted on the network. It's trying to stay as neutral as possible um, and to move as quickly as possible to resist capture. So 100, 100 anonymous nodes is better than three dudes in the multi -seek. That's all Fortran's trying to say. And today we've got billions, tens of billions, you know, Coinbase is theoretically 90 to 100 billion dollars worth of assets in this platform and its custody. Binance probably has 50 billion in its custody. Kraken's got 10 to 20 billion, I think. Um, we need to move all these assets out of those uh, exchanges and into decentralized custody. So. Uh, even REN protocol, uh, Keep Network, Somalia, everything, this is all on a continuum of decentralization. On the far left, you've got three dudes with multi sig. On the far right, you've got this crazy unknown, as yet um, unbuilt protocol. Probably something used to use signatures or something crazy like that. 
which has a thousand nodes running or ten thousand nodes running, you know, signature aggregation on on Bitcoin, which is a feasibility in the next few years. And then you've got in the middle things like Ren Protocol, Thorchain, Somalia, um, that are like halfway between the three dudes multi multi sig with this crazy ten thousand node network decentralized custody um, network that is yet to be invented. So that's where we're at today. Everything's on a continuum from left to right. And we're just trying to move the needle, right? We're just trying to all go across to decentralization, which is better than what we've had for the last 10 years. Yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I just let you run with that because that was beautiful. Uh, <laughs> uh, like the vision was beautiful. Okay. Uh, we're running a little bit over time, but what's exciting? What's coming up? What's, what's, what's new and exciting for, for, for Thorchain uh, users, for the Thorchain community? Uh, what does the next, you know, uh, 30, 60 days look like? Yeah, sure. So achieving mainnet. Mainnet will be achieved when there's um, 30 million rune bonded, 50 million rune pulled, over 40 nodes. Uh, today it's at 36. And But most importantly, it's it's 30 days without any bugs. So the clock gets reset um, every time there's a major bug. And there was a major bug three days ago, two days ago. Uh, smart contract um, error, a re-entrancy attack. So the clock keeps getting reset. Um, the team are looking for 30 days of no major bugs. Um, and then go to mainnet. And mainnet means the nodes control MEMA. So the nodes now control the system parameters. Um, caps will come off so people can add as much liquid as you want. Um, they've got to be responsible for their own decision. Um, so that's a big event. And then it's um, at a sharded vault, which will happen in the next few days. And that's demonstrating that Thorchain has crossed the Rubicon. It's now uh, decentralized, uncapped, and nodes have full control. That's going to happen in the next six to eight weeks. And then over the next six to 12 months will be activation of more chains, um, activation of the IBC. IBC is very exciting because it's a very scalable way of connecting with IBC equipped chains like Cosmos. Um, big one would be you know Osmosis, um, Terra. Uh, it means much more efficient means of connecting and bridging to those chains and a lot more assets in on the chain. Um, so more chains more and more four or five features. So upcoming will be um, synthetic assets, uh, fixed interest yield, and a huge one will be cross-chain uh, fixed int fixed um, yeah fixed interest lending. So you'll be able to lock in you know your ten bitcoin, your hundred bitcoin, and you can withdraw it out at one two percent um, interest. Well, depend it depends on a few things, but it's fixed interest, um, which is just mind blowing how that's achieved. But if you if you withdraw your loan and it's one percent interest, you pay that for life, 1% interest on that specific loan, which is pretty crazy, and cross-chain as well. So deposit Bitcoin, withdraw USDT um, across two different chains. So that's coming. Um, yeah, and it, so the next 12 months is, is pretty big for th features, and in 12 months' time, it's obviously planned obsolescence. The planned obsolescence is very important. At some point, the, origin, the original core protocol team need to publicly hand over and go, we're out of here. And that's set for July 2022, which is 12 months post mainnet. And that will be a public ceremony that the entire team and treasury is basically exit stage left. The treasury will be handed over to the community. Probably five to ten uh, major teams in the community will receive that hundred million dollar treasury split up um, in proportion, and they will then be charged to deliver the next five to ten year roadmap for the chain. And the original team are completely out of there. So it's it's a very defining moment for the protocol that it's it, not even the original team is hanging around anymore. They're all gone. And rightfully so, and that's that's happening in the next twelve months. That's a what incredibly fantastic and ambitious vision. Um, there's one question that came in from the audience that I wanted to talk about, just because I kind of love the topic. Is uh, talking about composability in Thorchain. Thorchain is not composable. Can you explain why and why that's not a bad thing? Um, uh, I thought there was a. I think it was Ryan Watkins who who did a really good tweet thread about this. But I, I actually think the, I think that uh, Thorchain has done a really good job of, of turning what is frequently thought of as a weakness into a strength by sort of uh, internalizing a lot of the application space. Um, uh, uh, yeah, correct. So Thorchain is not composable. The reason why is because everything's fire and forget. Um, if you do an event on Chain A, it fires into Thorchain, and the Thorchain will eventually do it. Um, but Thorchain has no accountability back to that original transaction. So it never goes back to the person and say, oh, by the way, we did it, um, and post that on chain, at least at least today. So on a composable event, you normally have your 
your event, your action, and then you get receipt of that action being done. And ThorChain does, never, does not give you a receipt. Um, well, the receipt is held, but it's not in the ThorChain state machine. So it's not composable. The problem with composability is, well, one, ThorChain goes, well, why do you need composability? Why don't we just do everything ourselves? So it's, it's giving you synthetic assets, yields, liquidity pools, um, and lending all inside it's a single state machine. Uh, so it doesn't need to give you a composability because it's it's basically saying, well, we don't need composability. Just, just do what you want in ThorChain itself. Um, the second reason is not all the chains it connects to are smart. Um, so, you know, Bitcoin to Ethereum and back again. So, yeah, well, how does a... So if you... if you How are you going to make those two composable? Like, there's no way, like, Bitcoin can... T can relay a message back to Ethereum and say, "Oh yeah, we did the action that you did, that you wanted." Um, so, so there's also that, that those difficulties. Um, so, Thorchain is like the smart uh, adapter that that doesn't bother treats change as dumb and just and as all as equal. And the third reason is it primarily tries to seek um, achieve a security budget from things it does on its own chain in its own pools. Um, if you offer a composable network, you're just relaying messages and you. Then, then the question is, well, how much do you charge in fees for relaying messages? And ThorChain goes, you know what? It's too hard basket. We're not doing it. So if you want a composable cross-chain, you're probably going to have to settle for something that is composable between all different L2s and the EVM space. Various alternatives there. You've got Connect. You've got um, eSwap Network. You've got Multi-Chain, all, all, all of that. REN Protocol is some, is you know composable between different EVM chains. So um, yeah, that's that's the answer. Blockchain does not try to be composable for various reasons. Fantastic. Um, there are actually a bunch of other interesting questions. I don't know if you see them in the chat, but uh, oh, uh, right. I don't want to take up too much of your time either. Like we we, we we try to keep these things short and sweet. Do um, you want to answer one more question? Go for it. Okay. Uh, how does accountability work for five to ten teams receiving a hundred million dollars for development once the team leave? Once the original team leaves. Yeah, so you can think of the original ThorChain team um, had accountability of the 1.5 million on Treasury and turn it into 100 million. Um, and they only did it because they were investing in the long-term success of the network. So when, when this Treasury is handed over to the community, it's not handing over to complete strangers. They will be teams that have been building on ThorChain for the preceding 12 months. Well-known by the community, well-known by node operators, well-known by the, the devs. So that there's no surprises that this team, which is building X on ThorChain, is receiving why for so many years um it's this none of this has been done before so the way you think it is seven instead of a single team having single treasury the plan is to have five to ten teams with five to ten smaller treasuries building on different parts of the stack and being accountable to the community um in that way um so you know will it work um you know it has worked the last few years um the team needs to go out and find aligned individuals node operators are on different uh, public teams building on thoughtchain make good candidates because they're invested in the success of the network. They've got equity in the network being the node bond. Someone's got to build. They're willing to do it. They're willing to be accountable. They're willing to be presentable to the community. So yeah, it's still a, it's still a risk and it's still something that needs to be done, but it has to be done. Fantastic. Uh, thank you for your time, JP. Uh, and uh, have a good day. Thanks, Aki, and uh, love what you're doing in the space, obviously. And you know, we, we, two teams know each other for the last three years and we're, you know, similar how you say, you know, the thought chain remained focused in line with their vision. Well, we can say the same thing to, you know, all the teams that you work with, Zaki, that, you know, the whole idea of Cosmos being this inter this kind of like SDK for chains. You know, I, I refer to Cosmos as the Linux of blockchains. So Linux is free. It's open source. It gets everywhere. It's used in Tesla, it's SpaceX, use it in their rockets. Um, yeah, it's, it's everywhere because it's free. It's ugly but it works. And that was the vision of Linus Torvald is that was his vision to, to try and beat out proprietary and closed source systems just by just being open source and ugly. And you know what, Zachary, open source and ugly gets you very far. And that's what Cosmos <laughs> is. It's open source, ugly and free. I mean, it's not ugly. Some parts are very elegant and beautiful, uh, but that, you know, it's a bit of a slang word, open source, ugly and free. And that's why Cosmos, I believe is the best place, to, is the best infrastructure to build on. Um, for for a um, you know a decentralized state machine that needs to do really cool stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, like, like it, it's just a huge demo. Like again, Thorchain is a is by far the most complex. You know, everyone asks. I frequently get asked. I'm like, what is the most complex state machine that exists on top of the Cosmos stack? And I'm always like, right now, Thorchain. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. So well, it's it's demonstrating the power of power of Cosmos and a lot of crazy logics in that state machine. And Cosmos just, you know, it just point four one just churned through. What was it? The Stargate release. It's yep. good. It just it's it's good and it works. There's a lot more performance improvements coming down the pike. So yeah. Okay. Look, looking forward to uh to merge upstream. <laughs> Sweet. All right. Thanks, JP. No worries, Zach. Okay, speak soon.